it's a great honor to be here, um, to, you know, just to speak at this meeting and to have my first trip ever to India. Um, I'm grateful that I'm somehow still called a young mentor. <laughs> Hope that keeps going. Um, okay, so um, uh, when I was, you know, taking advice on how to, how to explain this talk and, and thinking about this talk, I, uh, um, I put a pretty heavy emphasis on the story and sort of things that I've learned. I have a little bit of science in here. I was also asked to include some non-science stuff I've done in the talk, so I, um, hopefully I can get through this in, in 25 minutes. Okay. So Ron, in his introduction last night, had beautiful pictures of the, of the mountains that he'd taken before the, the snow came down. Uh, I put this picture in, which I took a few days ago down in the bird sanctuary in Bratpur of uh, one of my favorite animals. These are bar-headed geese that are famous because they fly over Mount Everest, over the summit of Mount Everest. And I put them here for this talk because um, if bar-headed geese had taken advice from biologists, they would never do something like fly over Mount Everest. Someone would have said, this is impossible, you can't do it, there's not enough oxygen up there to breathe, and they, you know, the air's too thin, you can't flap your wings. Why don't you do something easier and safer and go around the big mountains or something like that? So they never would have done what they want to do, which is a, sort of a theme I want to keep to, which is uh, the most important advice that I want to give you is don't ever listen to advice. Okay? <laughs> so most advice you get is just, just intrinsically bad. Um, it, 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 it's, it's rarely tailored, tailored to you, and um, I think in general, uh, as I'll say at the end, uh, where I've gotten a lot of advice from people, uh, if I had listened to it, I wouldn't have done any of the things that I've done in my career. I am going to have sort of some, I guess, I don't know, words of wisdom or things I've learned along the way, but I want you to not think of them as advice per se, but rather as um, evidence that if you think about problems like I do, if you happen to, you know, you should always do science and be the kind of scientist you are and you want to be, but if you happen to uh, share philosophies, ways about doing things that I do, uh, maybe you can take the fact that I've been able to succeed uh, by doing certain things in science as some kind of uh, encouragement for you not to listen to advice that people tell you uh, that, that might conflict with the things you, you want to do. And I also was struck last night talking to a few of the other mentors here about, uh, I almost never hear from uh, successful scientists that uh, they got to where they were by listening to anybody else. So um, it's, it's sort of a theme in science, I think, is to, is to make your own way. You can learn from other people, but I think advice in general is a, is a dangerous thing. Okay. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about how, how I got to where I was as, as a scientist. And, and as I said in my abstract, and I think you see a lot of pictures here of really old computers, uh, old computer played a, an important role in my life. This is a, actually a, a Radio Shack computer, a Tandy uh, TRS-80 computer that I got for my, uh, my 12th birthday from my grandfather. Um, and, um, you know, I'd like to say I did something really uh, grandiose and intellectual with this, with this computer. But in fact, for the, for the first four or five years of my uh, computing life, I used this computer uh, almost entirely to satisfy my obsession with baseball statistics. Um, and, uh, you know, I followed real baseball, but I also, uh, along with a bunch of my friends, engaged in a dice-based baseball simulation uh, that we played obsessively over the years. And I taught myself how to program a computer uh, in order to write a database to keep track of our dice-based uh, baseball game. So really, my, my scientific career, uh, in many ways, was born out of my interest in baseball. At the time I was doing all this, I was sure that my future career was going to be as a baseball player. But perhaps I, I should have uh, realized that I, having spent more time in front of a computer than on a baseball field, that wasn't likely to be. Um, it turned out that also when I was a kid, I, I excelled in math. I won various math competitions. I was, I was very, very good at math. And so I went off to college uh, pretty much convinced that, since I'd given up on baseball, that I was going to be a mathematician. And I enrolled in a, uh, um, uh, the math department at Harvard, you know, one of the top math departments in the, in the country. I was uh, pretty sure I was going to go through there. I was going to you know, continue to excel in mathematics, and, and that that was going to be my career. But then in my freshman uh, year, I, I had a class with this guy. This is not his picture from college. This is a, a recent picture. And it's a mathematician named Bjorn Poonen. 
And I took this class with him, and within about a week of taking this class, I realized that this guy was so much better mathematician than I was that uh, I couldn't even understand the questions he was asking during class. And I think math is a pretty bad field to be second best in because most of the people who do really important things are sort of at the top of the field, and everybody else is just filling in their blanks. And I did not want to be someone who was filling in the blanks for, for other mathematicians. And so I passed it around for quite a while. I continued as a math major. It was a pretty fun major to be. It had relatively few requirements. But I, I, I already knew that the two things I thought I was going to do in my life, play baseball and math, that I wasn't going to be able to do either of these things by, by the age of 18. And so, um, so what did I do? I, 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 um, I, I sort of fell back on something I'd always loved to do as a kid, which was hang out in, in nature. I took a bunch of jobs in the summer and during the school year, studying in, mostly studying insects, because I liked insects. Uh, I spent a summer out in a field station in the, in the high mountains of Colorado, studying flies and how they pollinate wildflower. But I found that, that while I liked to hang out in the woods a lot, I didn't like to do science in the woods. I didn't like to count bugs. I didn't, I, it just wasn't, it just didn't, I just didn't work for me. Even though I, in some, some ways, I, I, I read that decision. And so I got through my, my undergraduate career, and I was trying to figure out what to do as a scientist. I, I decided I wanted to be a scientist. In some ways, I sort of always knew I wanted to be a scientist. Um, and, um, and so I, I enrolled in a graduate program in biophysics. And in the, U, the US, graduate programs in the biophysics are basically where you go. If you have a background in math or computer science or physics or something like this, you're interested in biology, but you don't really know very much biology. You don't really know what you're going, what, what you're going to do. And um, I ended up doing my PhD thesis uh, working on protein structure. So it's in an X-ray crystallography lab with a, with a, uh, a fabulous scientist named Don Wiley. And, the reason I went into extra crystallography was there's actually a lot of math in extra crystallography. There's a lot of equations that were important in the early history of, of, of crystallography. I felt that I could sort of satisfy my interest in evolution by studying the evolution of proteins. That was something more tangible. I could do more quantitative studies on them. I, I did a, a lot of different things in, in, in my graduate career. Um, and, I, and as I was thinking back on this as I prepared for the talk, I, I realized that this was the one time in my life when I went into extra crystallography where I'd done something in a calculated manner. I said, well, what can I do? I'm, I mean, I'm interested in math, I'm interested in biology. Let's try extra crystallography. I didn't really love extra crystallography. I did it because I felt like it was the right thing to do. And although I had a very successful, and in fact, I was quite enjoyed my graduate career, when I got done with graduate school, I realized that I, I, I worked on something that really wasn't what I wanted to, to, to do with my career. And so I abandoned my, my PhD work. Um, and I shifted fields in, in entirely. And, and this is you know, one of these things I think you hear from everybody. There was a, a, a huge element of luck here. I happened to meet David Botstein, who ended up being one of my PhD advisors, because he was in Cambridge, where I finished my, my PhD thesis, because his brother was getting some honorary degree. And I met him, and he told me about this great new invention that had come from Pat Brown's lab which was the DNA microarray. So Pat was one of the pioneers in, um, in, in creating DNA microarrays in his lab at Stanford. And so I set out, actually after having spent the summer as a, as a baseball announcer on the radio with the PhD and uh, postdoc, so I still had that obsession. <laughs> I set off to, to David and Pat's lab um, to do a postdoc. And, and Pat really has become the, the, the most influential person in, in, in my scientific career. For, for a bunch of reasons I'll, I'll talk about. And I just want to stop for a second and say, you know, I learned quite a lot from these people, but none of this came in the way of advice. This was all stuff I, I learned just by watching them, watching the type of people that they were as scientists. And so I thought I, I'd just throw in a few of these things here. And one of the things I, I learned by watching Pat was, you know, was really not to let practical concerns about publishing, grants, promotion, get in your way of, of being a, an idealistic scientist to do science like the way science should be done. And the thing I really learned from, from sort of watching it was that being open and idealistic about science, it's, it's not only fun, but actually it tends to work out to your benefit in the long run. One other thing I learned by, by, by hanging out with Pat was that you know, there's really two types of, 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 of crazy things that you think about. There's impossible problems, things that you really can't do anything about. And, and you want to avoid things that are really impossible, so you don't spend your whole life doing something 
Um, but then there's things that are just really, really, really difficult. And, and those are the kind of problems you do want to work on. And it's actually not that easy to tell the difference between an impossible problem and a problem that's really, really, really difficult. But learning to do so is, is, is critically important. And then the other thing I learned, again, primarily from Pat, was, was uh, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple ways this manifests itself, was never underestimate the ability of, of a relatively small number of people, the people you have in your lab, the people you have around you, to make a huge difference in science, uh, in, in the way that science works, and, and increasingly in the, in the world at large. I think we, we often sort of look at these really difficult problems and say, yeah, I, I, you know, those are important to do, but I don't have any, I, what am I going to do? I'm just, just one person. And, and uh, I think I've, I've learned convincingly by, by hanging out with Pat and, and, and for things I've done myself that, that actually you can do a, a lot of interesting, important things if you, if you set your mind to. Okay, so I want to tell just two little vignettes about, about my career that, that uh, since I, I was a postdoc, that um, touch on things that, that I think are maybe potentially useful. So, um, okay, so what did I do as a postdoc? So I got to Pat's lab, and Pat, you know, they had just started printing DNA microarrays, and uh, what was going on in Pat's lab was taking these arrays and just doing a bazillion different experiments. People were doing all sorts of things, looking at gene expression in human cells, and yeast cells, and fly cells, and in, in cancer and normal tissues and, and whatever people could, could do. We had collaborators sort of beating down the door to get microarrays to do different experiments. And so we had a pretty good handle on how to do the experiments, but we had very little idea about what to do with the uh, data. So I spent most of my postdoctoral career developing ways of, of dealing with just the, this, this huge influx of information that was coming into the, into the lab. I'm not going to really talk a lot about what I did. It was initially thinking about ways of, of, of organizing and, and displaying this information so you could, you could use your mind to, to see patterns and try to make relationships between the patterns you were seeing and, and, and the data. But as a result of the work I did in Pat's lab, um, I became sort of pretty well known in the, in the field and uh, you know, lots and lots of people used my software, my paper got, got very high and cited. And so on the basis of that work, I got a lot of job offers, and I ultimately took a job at, at Berkeley, initially at, at Lawrence Berkeley National. And, and I, I realized something during this job search I had, which was that I had been uh, pigeonholed by, by, the, by the biology community. Everybody sort of thought of me not as Michael Eisen, but as Michael Eisen Computational Lab. Okay. And it was indeed true that I had spent most of my postdoctoral career writing software and, um, and doing computation. Uh, but I never thought of myself as a, as a computational biologist. I thought of myself as a scientist who just happened to have done work in computational biology. And I, I realized I had, a, I had in front of me a career. You know, at the time, and actually still to this day, 15 years later, everybody wanted to hire a computational biologist. Everybody wanted to collaborate with computational biologists. I could have had a very, very successful career just being a computational biologist. But I think it's a big mistake to allow yourself in science to be, uh, to be categorized in, in some way. It, it, you might think of this as a good thing, people, people know you, but it's actually quite limiting. And, and if I had stuck with just being a computational biologist, I don't think I would have done uh, anything near as, as, as interesting and, and, and fun as what I've, what I've done in my, my career. And so I sort of retreated from the field for a couple of years, not taking advantage of the work I'd done as a, as a postdoc, not taking advantage of my, um, my, you know, my, my uh, the fact that I was well known and could have, could have gotten lots of grants and, and collaborations through this. And I, I, I sat back and I tried to figure out what it was that I really wanted to work on. And I realized that there was a problem that had always percolated around my work in, in, at Stanford, but which had never really gotten a chance to, to attack, which was uh, a, a question that tied together with my interest in animals, it tied together with my interest in evolution, and it used the fact that we've been now developing methods for studying uh, gene expression and for sequencing genomes, and it was this question, which was, you know, how, did, how is it that, that animals make patterns of gene expression that are, are restricted to certain cells, certain tissues, certain times in development, how is that information encoded in the genome? 
I actually thought quite naively at the time that we were, that this problem was, was relatively tractable. It's turned out to be a, a little bit more complicated problem. But I decided it, it, that this is what I, this is the problem I wanted to work on. And that I actually had to learn a whole suite of new things. I was not a developmental biologist. I was not a, you know, I'd never taken a developmental biology class in my life. I didn't know embryology. I never really worked on, on Drosophila in the lab, which was the model system I, I started to do. So I consciously shed, or tried to shed, this, this uh, idea that I was a computational biologist to go off and do something different. And um, my lab has evolved over the years. Initially, of course, we were very good at computation, so we, we used, our, used our skills. But um, you know, so one of the things my lab did early on was figure out some ways of looking at the genome of Drosophila melanogaster to recognize where there might be regulatory sequences, things that control gene expression. When we realized that these computational methods weren't going to work very well, we went off and started to do experiments, initially kind of genomic -y experiments when we were looking at where transcription factors were binding in the genome to try to figure out where you might have regulatory sequences uh, across the genome and how they might work. To do this, my lab had to learn how to do a different set of experiments. We needed to learn how to work with fly embryos and so forth. As we started to work with fly embryos, we realized that there were lots of limitations in these experiments. Um, we continued to do computation. We followed up, and, and I'm intentionally glossing over my science here because it, it would take me, it always takes me about an hour and a half to go through this in detail. I'm happy to talk to you guys about this. I just want to use this to illustrate the sort of evolution of the lab. We, um, we had the sort of thing you hear about in every scientist's uh, career, which was a kind of random observation. In this case, a random observation about a piece of DNA that was found in all of the regulatory sequences we'd identified in the, in the fly genome. We, um, um, we, we, we realized that, the, that the, if we wanted to study what the sequence did, we had to change the way that experiments were done in the field. And so we switched from, you know, we taught ourselves how to work with very, very small amounts of material, how to look at fly embryos and sort them and recognize what was going on with them. It, it was a, my lab has undergone this major, major transition from a point where initially everybody was a computational biologist to the point where now every, almost everybody's an experimentalist. I, I, I know I'm now sort of oddly the best computer programmer in the lab, which wasn't true in years ago. I'm now the worst experimentalist, which is probably a good thing to do for the lab. Um, and, and after you know, quite a lot of, of, of diverse experiments in a lot, a lot of different ways, we actually have made what, what, what I think of as a, as a crucial discovery about how gene regulatory sequences work, which is that the, um, the, the type of information that's put into the genome is, is actually found in two different, there's two different types of information. There's one type of information that says, here is a regulatory sequence. It, it doesn't tell, tell you what the regulatory sequence does, it's kind of like a promoter. It says, this is where we're going to put a gene what a promoter says, these, this information that we're working on says, Here, here's where we're going to put a regulatory sequence. And then there's an entirely different set of information encoded in the genome that says what that regulatory sequence does, just like the sequence of a uh, protein coding gene tells you. So I'm happy to talk to you guys about this uh, uh, offline, uh, about the science and so forth. But um, I, I want to say what, you know, in that, in that 15 years of time, I've had my own lab and we've undergone this transition, what, what have I learned? So the first thing, and you, you've heard about this already, which is, you know, give the people in your lab a lot of freedom. The, the worst thing to do is to, is, to, is to tell your students exactly what to do. Because you, what you'll get if you tell your students exactly what to do is you'll get exactly what you told them to do, which is rarely the, the most interesting thing. I'd say five or six times in my career, I, I have had that, this experience of giving a student free reign, having them do something that I would have told them not to do. And it turns out to be the most important and interesting thing that the lab had done in the, in the, in the couple of years. Another thing, and I think this, this comes from my experience with computational biology, which is, is a lot, people always are telling you to play to your strengths, right? You're good at something, you should keep doing that. Whatever it is, just keep, keep doing what, what you're doing. Uh, I, I think that this is actually ter terrible advice. Um, in general, as a scientist, you should follow problems wherever they take you. You, know, learn, you can learn new things. We're, we're all smart. That's what got us here. You can learn to do new things. And don't let people classify you. And, 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 and in particular, don't classify yourself. Think of yourself as, as a scientist, not as some kind of film-blank biologist. 
And this is related to a quote that I, I love. I think probably you guys have heard this quote, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. There's actually a, a mutation of that quote that I heard attributed to an MIT physicist, but I don't know who originally said that, which is that if something's worth doing, it's actually worth doing poorly. So uh, uh, almost everything that we've done in my lab, we've been terrible at when we started to do it. Okay? And I think a lot of us are really reluctant to do things that we're bad at. But you're always bad at things when, when you do them initially. And, and, and you know, if it's really worth doing, it's worth doing poorly at the beginning, and, and, and you learn how to, how to do it well. And I think if there's anything I've seen other scientists do that I think is bad, it has been this reluctance to, to go into new areas, to do things that you don't understand, that you don't know well, and, and to not trust in your ability to, uh, to learn from it. Um, and the other thing is, I've sort of been in a bunch of fields that have gone through fads. So the, you know, the microarray area was, was the most faddish thing that's happened in science in, in years. You know, it originally started in one lab, and within two years, everybody was doing it. There were meeting, huge meetings about it, and it was miserable. It's really miserable to work in a field when, when people are, are attracted to the field because it's, it's hot and faddish. And the same thing happened, actually, oddly, with the study of gene regulation in Drosophila, which is now what I work on, which is, for some reason, I've never fully understood. In about the year 2004, lots and lots of people got interested in this field. They rushed into it. The field got nasty. People were doing crummy science. It, uh, it, was, it was miserable. But then, fortunately, People who are drawn to fads have very short attention spans, and eventually they go away. And um, there's a great quote from, uh, I think it's from Sidney Brenner, that says something about along the lines of the best time to work on a problem is before everyone's interested and after they've lost interest. It's, it's actually very, very bad to work on a field when everybody's interested in it. Um, it, it, it it's, it's unpleasant, and actually almost always faddish science is, 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 bad, is bad science. Okay. I wanted to shift gears uh, 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 for a second here to, to come back to the other thing that happened to me when I was a uh, postdoc in past life. You know, at the same time we were doing all these experiments with, with DNA microarrays, you know, I was writing software to try to figure out what, the, what these arrays were, were meaning, but, but we realized something else that was, was a problem, which was, you know, science had shifted, and again, most of you are too young to, to remember this, this happening, but, but when I was in graduate school, you know, I worked on one protein for seven years in graduate school, the influenza hemagglutinin, it's, like, it's a stock protein on the surface of the uh, I think I had read, or at least I had Xerox and sat on my desk and looked at every single paper that had ever been published uh, in English, Russian, and a few other languages, <laughs> right? I couldn't read the Russian ones, but I could look at um, and about that protein. And I still have a stack of those papers in my office. It, it's about that tall. And that is the entire literature on that, on that one protein. And it was, you know, I'm not, I won't say that I knew everything about that protein, but I, had, I, I, I was at least, I was pretty close to knowing everything about that protein. And I was definitely knew more than anybody else at the time about, 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 that, about that protein. And um, then I shifted to, uh, to, 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 this, to this system where, th this I should say is a microarray with every gene from yeast on it. It's one of the first whole genome yeast microarrays that was made. I shifted to this situation where we were doing experiments not just on one gene, but on 6,000 genes at a time. Okay? And, you know, I certainly did not have the, the patience or memory to have read, at the time there were something like 30,000 papers that had been published on, on genes in, in Saccharomyces. There was no way that anyone could have read all those papers, and even if they had, to have stored all that information in their head, to be able to look at these, um, um, look at the data from an experiment and know what random piece of information that someone had published 10 years ago was going to help you understand this experiment. But it just so happened, coincidentally, I think, that the era of the DNA microarray and, and the birth of the DNA microarray corresponded to the birth of the modern internet. And um, so at the same time we were doing these experiments, uh, science publishing was shifting from uh, everything happening in print to, to everything happening online. And that transition happened very, very quickly. Over the course of about two or three years, from 1995 to 1998, essentially every uh, scientific journal, every significant scientific journal, started publishing electronic copy. And so uh, Pat and I started to to, to, to think about this and realize that 
you know, we could write computer programs to deal with the data, but wouldn't it be great if we could also write computer programs that would take all of the now electronic scientific literature and somehow fold that in to the, to the way we were looking at, the, at these experiments. We didn't know how. We still don't really know how, for reasons I'll tell you in a second, how, how to do that. But we thought, well, you know, we'll figure something out. It won't solve all our problems, but it'll certainly be easier than, than having to find the papers in, in a, in a one-off way. So, and another little bit of a coincidence, the Stanford University Library, which was about a mile from where Pat's lab was, was a major um, um, uh, electronic publisher of scientific journals. And so we thought, well, isn't this convenient? I'll just take a big disk. So we, we bought the biggest disk we could, which I think at the time was like 256 megabytes. And um, we, uh, we brought it to the Stanford Library, and we said, hey, can you give us all those papers that you've published? I'm not sure if they would have fit on the disk, but they pretty close. We said, can you give us all these papers? And uh, you know, we want to do this school. We have these interesting ideas. Can you, can you give the papers to us? And they said, they looked at us in this weird way, and they said, no. You know, we own those papers. They don't belong to you. And uh, this was a complete and total shock to me. Right? The idea that, that the product of scientific literature is actually not owned by the scientific community. I mean, who, who, who thought? Who would have thought that? Was, OK. Um, and so um, um, Pat and I, uh, after getting over our initial shock at this, we started to ask the question, you know, what could we do about this? And, and in fact, you know, this was really uh, you know, where I, I would say I've learned the most from Pat. For me, as a postdoc at the time, I looked at this problem and I said, OK, this is terrible. It's terrible that publishers own the scientific literature. It's terrible that I can't get all these papers. But um, what am I going to do about it? I'm just a, I'm just a postdoc. What, I, I, how am I going to influence the way that, that, that science and science publishing works? But Pat didn't think that way. Pat said, you know what? Let's figure out how to solve the problem. And so Pat and I uh, began what has turned out to be an, a, 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 an ongoing a quest to try to change that fact on the ground about the availability of the scientific literature. So there, there was going to be a slide here, but I, couldn't, I decided to put it in the last minute and couldn't get on the internet to illustrate the fact that we don't have access to the scientific literature. So, so what did we do? So, so um, we looked at this problem and said, well, you know, the real culprit here is that the whole way we do science publishing is ridiculous. And, and so let's just destroy the whole system and start from scratch. Let's say well, now we have the internet, right? We don't have to deal with the fact that, that we're technologically limited by print. So we have the internet. Let's, let's create a completely new system for scientific publishing. And so we did that. We, we decided, well, let's get, entirely get rid of journals. Instead of having journals, we'll just publish our papers when we're ready to share them. We'll review them after they're, after they're submitted. And you know it'll be freely available to everybody. It won't cost that much money. The NIH can fund the system. Um, the NIH, it turned out, was very willing to do that. Harold Barmas, who was the, the head of the NIH at the time, thought this was a was a great idea. And um, and he put forward this proposal to to, to do what 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 we the idea we come up with. And the scientific community uh, hated it. Right? Pretty much everybody said, No, what are you doing? You can't get rid of our journals. What are we? How are we going to? You know, you know, how are we going to decide what works are good? How are we going to decide who to hire? How are we going to decide whatever? So the, pro the, the plan was, was kill. Um, so undaunted, Pat and I said, well, OK, if we can't get, the, if we can't, if we can't get the, the, the scientific community to go along with us and mass, maybe we can show people that actually scientists want the system to change, even if their, their, their leaders don't. So we organized a you know, the letter campaign. And it's, turned into a boycott, but then it turned out that this didn't, didn't work either. Um, um, so we finally realized that if we, if we wanted to actually change the way the world worked, we had to put our money where our mouths were and actually try to change things. Not just try to convince people to change things, but to try to do it ourselves. And so Pat and I started um, uh, a publisher, which we ultimately ended up calling the Public Library of Science, which, which I'm sure you guys, you guys know about. And, but, but, uh, you know, the idea was, you know, we want to do things differently, so let's just do things differently, despite the fact that literally everybody was telling us that this was crazy, this was never going to work, you know, uh, you, you can't change a system like this. 
we, we decided uh, uh, to do it. And the, the principle behind class was simple, that we would create a business that what made it possible for articles to be available for free for both download and, and reuse. And to, to really, the, the philosophy was to treat the business of publishing as a service to the community. And, and, and you get paid for the service, but the journals don't own the content. Um, um, when you know, the, the movement that PLOS started was going slowly, it, it, it was successful, we, we decided, well, we, we need some, some, more, some more push here. And so we started to lobby the government. I would have said, you know, lobbying the government to do something good is, is even more difficult than getting science publishing to change. But, but actually, I, I, I realized that, that if, you, if you have reasonably good ideas, that even something as, as immovable as the US government can occasionally do something positive. And so the, uh, we convinced the, the federal government to start to make uh, published works uh, freely available. Indeed, it's also now true of the Indian government. The Indian government is now starting to require that this work becomes freely available. And, and um, the ultimate sign that, that we've been successful in doing this is that all the publishers who told us that we were crazy, that, they didn't, that, that we were going to destroy their businesses, that no one was going to like this, have all started their own open access publishers. You saw Nature does it now, Science does it, Elsevier and Cell do it. It's not, we're not done with this battle, but I would say that, that uh, from uh, a starting point 15 years ago where uh, it was basically just me and Pat and, and, and everybody telling us that this was, was crazy, we've now shown that this, that, that, that this can change and that the, the, the world of science publishing is changing. And there's a lot more to do. I'm happy to talk to you guys about this later. I think open access is only one of the challenges. Uh, and I'll just finish off by saying the, the, the most important thing I would say from, from my experience with PLOS with LEARN is that we had to ignore all the advice I ever got on this subject. I've literally never gotten a single bit of useless, useful advice having to do with, with publishing from anybody. Okay, everything anybody's ever told me has either been wrong-headed or, or counterproductive. And, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Like, like, there were thousands of scientists who were telling us that this was, this was just a, a, we were tilting at windmills. It was never going to work. That the, you can't change something that's this big where there's so much money at stake and where the publishers have so much power. Um, I was told on a personal level as I was starting my career Right, we started PLOS when I was a junior scientist. People were saying, you can't do this. If you give up publishing in Science or Nature and Cell, you'll never get tenure, you'll never get grants, uh, you'll never be successful as a scientist, and the people in your lab will, will suffer. This has turned out not to be true. And people also told me that, you know, you know, this may be an important challenge, it may be important to do, but if you spend your time on something that's outside the lab, it will ruin your career because you won't be able to do good science. Something I think that's also turned out uh, not to be true. And, and so, you know, I, I really want to encourage people to not just think about the problems that you face in your research, but think about the broader problems in science, or indeed even in the, the greater world, and try to do something that, that, that's going to make a positive change in the way that science works, science funding works, the culture of science, and so forth. And I'll just finish pointing out that, that you can ask why is there a hamburger here. There's a reason. Um, this is actually not really a hamburger. This is a hamburger that's made entirely from plants. And, and uh, I put this up here because Pat has, gone, has, has now uh, quit his lab at Stanford. And if you thought going after the you know, $10 billion a year publishing industry was crazy, he is applying a career's worth of, of insights and ideas and things he's learned from being a biochemist to a problem of trying to make the world a better place. And the problem he's trying to deal with is the fact that we are destroying our planet with, by filling it with, with farm animals. I think you heard last night from VJ that the total biomass of, of humans and, and farm animals, which are really humans and cows for the most part, is now something like 99% of the vertebrate, vertebrate land mass. Uh, if our trend in the planet, I said India is relatively easy, uh, not a great contributor to this problem, but if our trend in beef consumption on the planet goes up, we're going to fill North America, South America, and Africa entirely with, with cows in about the next 50 years. So uh, I'm not going to tell you about what, how Pat got to this point and how this is being made, but it's also something I, 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 I'd be happy to talk about. But the real principle here is this is an example of a way in which a scientist can do something completely 
uh, seemingly crazy to try to make the, the world a better place, but still just being, being a scientist and being a geek in the lab. Okay, I will stop right there. Um, I probably went over time. Uh, hopefully you will ignore all the advice I give you because I think in general advice is bad. But, um, but anyway, I'm happy to take your questions.